Hello friends welcome to the third episode of my podcast series titled Urban Nexalism Old Wine in a New Bottle This episode is called Communists the Original Breaking India Forces Before we begin this episode let us quickly recap the highlights of the previous episode We saw how the destructive forces of language and culture policing phony causes like lgbtq and bizarre theories which have now become common place can be traced back to the frankfurt school in europe which in turn was founded by influential post world war 1 marxists and further how when their members migrated to the us and took powerful academic positions they began to systematically tear the american society apart The rough timeline of these events recounted in the previous episode covers the mid 1920s up to the early 1970s. In this episode, we will quickly and briefly examine the events that were occurring in India roughly in the same period. For the sake of convenience, I will not touch upon the Indian freedom struggle at any length because it is not a uh, Uh, largely relevant to the subject of our podcast that said the communist party of india was officially established on 26th december 1925 in a conference in kanpur that was its very first conference as well this is the official version given on the cpi's website but the communist party of india marxist that is cpim says that The party was founded in Tashkent on 17th October 1920. The founding members of the Communist Party of India included M N Roy, Evelyn Trent Roy, who was M N Roy's wife, Abani Mukherjee, Rosa Fittingoff, who in turn was Abani Mukherjee's wife, Muhammad Ali or Ahmed Hasan, Muhammad Shafiq Siddiqui. Rafiq Ahmed MP BT Acharya and Sultan Ahmed Khan Tareen of Northwest Frontier Province even today the communist parties be it CPI or CPIM both these parties look back in fond nostalgia and are quite proud of their history which includes yet another proud fact that there were many communist groups formed by indians with the help of foreigners in different parts of the world and that the tashkent group was only one of them in other words they boasted of the transnational nature of their movement and swearing allegiance to the only fatherland the then U- ussr to repeat a well known fact there was nothing and there is nothing there was nothing and there is nothing indian about the communists you can apply any label to them communists marxists leftists and the latest weasel word liberals the other common trait that animated and motivated the communists was a thirsty love for violence on a mass scale their role in the peshawar conspiracy case in the meerut conspiracy case the kanpur bolshevik case and much later their support for the bloodthirsty razakars of hyderabad need to be studied and studied repeatedly and held up as warnings for all time to come and so before independence of india the violent comrade M N Roy was busy smuggling arms into India from the USSR in order to sabotage the Indian freedom struggle and to create nationwide disruptions among other violent activities. Fast forward from there to the 1945-1947 period. That is just as India was about to get freedom from the British colonial rule. Another prominent communist uh, theorist of that time his name was comrade gangadhar adhikari he was the then secretary of the communist party of india 
who wrote an infamous position paper titled Pakistan and National Unity. This is also known as the Adhikari thesis. You would be misled by this innocuous sounding title. Of course, linguist deception, linguistic deception is a practiced art form of the communists. This notorious Adhikari thesis argued that every single caste, sub-caste, sect and sub-sect and even region and sub-region should have a separate country. In other words, he did not recognize that India was a united or could be a united country. But why would Gangadhar Adhikari write such a thing? The answer, the so-called position paper was a subterfuge for an endorsement of the Muslim League's demand for Pakistan and the willingness of the Communist Party of India to fully back it. Following this paper, the CPI passed a resolution demanding a separate nation for Muslims. In other words, the CPI was fully hand in glove with Jinnah and his Muslim League. And like the colonial British uh, uh, masters, Gangadhar Adhikari and his CPI holds that India was never a united country from Kashmir to Kanyakumari and that the idea of one nation, one people, one language never ever existed at any point in India's long history. Let me read out some excerpts from his position paper titled Pakistan and National Unity. Open quote. The Lingayat peasantry of Karnataka wakes up to an anti-imperialistic consciousness and develops a natural yearning for a free Karnataka. So it is with the Andhra, Tamils and with the Sindhis, Punjabis and the Pathans. As soon as we grasp that behind the demand for Pakistan is the justified desire of the people of Muslim nationalities such as Sindhis, Baluchis, Punjabis, Muslims, Pathans to build a free national life, there is a very simple solution to the communal problem in its new phase. Nationalities such as Sindhis, Baluchis, Pathans and Punjabi Muslims have the right to secede if they so desire. Wherever people of the Muslim faith living together in a territorial unit form a nationality, they certainly have the right to autonomous state existence. It cannot get clearer than that. Thus, if we follow Adhikari's logic or so-called logic, India should be split up into the following independent countries. A Lingayat India or a Lingayat nation, Kanyakumari as a separate country, Balochistan as a separate country, Sindhi as a separate country, Tamil as a separate country, Andhra as a separate country, Punjab as a separate country and Bengal as a separate country. The list is uh, nearly endless uh, and uh, suffice to say that this is the original avatar of what today are known as breaking India forces. And therefore, if you see a Siddharamaya today advocating a separate religion for Lingayats, if you see Mamata Banerjee claiming that she will wage civil war against the uh, uh, Indian Union, it is really clear where the inspiration comes from. But the great fortune of the communists, they got their most prized idiot in the form of a person named Jawaharlal Nehru who became the first Prime Minister of India. Indeed, think about it for a while. Which sane country on the earth even dedicates a national postage stamp to honor a murderer and a traitor like M. N. Roy and his gang? The story of how the communists systematically took control over the educational, intellectual and the media establishment is quite well known, so I will not get into the details. 
over the next 30 odd years that is after uh, india got independence and after uh, sardar vallabhbhai patel uh, died and after mr jawaharlal nehru's uh, power and influence became supreme over the next 30 odd years the communists and uh, the marxist establishment trained patronized and created a global nexus of academics and intellectuals by giving them fellowships and so on endowments chairs etc in prestigious universities abroad that includes the same columbia university that uh, uh, we examined in the previous episode as well as the university of uh, chicago the ambitious plan of the communists and the marxist establishment was and remains generational in nature and scope by the mid 1970s the first stream of ideologically brainwashed feminists and what are known as cultural marxists this gang began gaining prominence in indian public discourse of course uh, these feminists and the so called cultural marxists apart from them uh, there were also the apologists for the islamic and christian genocides and the uh, deniers and whitewashers of uh, islamic brutality in india these people had already occupied positions of power some people including the so called doyen of um, uh, marxist history in india the infamous romila thapar and others and uh, it was a sustained work of the next two generations of these radical feminists that dangerous laws like section 498a were passed in the indian parliament but notice how eerily similar such laws are to their counterparts in the us it is anybody's guess and uh, in fact it is a known fact that the justice system is almost near totally in favor of women in the united states i suppose with uh, uh, the machinations of the indian feminists we are india is also headed in the same direction in the next episode we will discuss about the levels at which this phenomenon known as urban nexalism operates if you like this podcast series click like share it and don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you have any suggestions please leave a comment in the comment section and so until the next time this is sandeep balakrishna signing off thank you